there in the conference center and there might be other people joining but so i believe uh, the door open so um yeah welcome um to all of you um in the who happen uh, to be in the room here and also the ones uh, joining online and our also to our distinguished panelists the representatives from the uh, governments and also our distinguished uh, authors um welcome to the to the event uh you can't have it one without the other ambition and implementation learnings from transport uh, policies in argentina brazil colombia mexico and the eu for the transparency of, of actions uh, my name is sebastian Wittner. i'm um, with the berlin governance platform who's hosting the um, secretariat of climate transparency and i'm uh, really honored to facilitate the um, discussions uh, and the event today first of all some uh we've done some housekeeping um the event will be uh, recorded. I, uh, we, we really hope that you would consent to this. If you don't, you are invited um, to leave uh, the room here or, or, or also to leave the, the, uh, the online chat. Secondly, um, for those who, of you who join online, um, please mute, mute your mic. Uh, my colleague uh, Zena Abbas uh, will moderate the chat and be responsible for you. So please collect your uh, questions. Um, and we will bring them to the to the floor once we get there in the second part of the conversation. So yeah, as you can see in the year of the global stock take, um, we follow this collective approach to, to learn from each other um, and allow for an ex exchange between countries in person um, and also online. Yeah, 2023, the year of the global stock take, uh, it will tell us where we are where would you need to go on a global level? And it will surely tell us fast and decisive action uh, is needed. But what's also needed to assess how countries are really implementing um, the commitments and to, to see and enable learning within the countries and between the countries. And today we are looking uh, forward uh, to, to, to check on one of the most important sectors for development, human interaction and exchange transport. But as we all know, it's also one of the, more, of the hardest uh, to await. Um, we were also learning from, from strongly connected, two strongly connected regions, being Latin America and the EU, on how decolonization policies are implemented. We will also discuss um, and uh, how these assessments can complement the global stock take and enhance implementation towards a successful COP28 and the period um, after that. Before we start, I also want to thank uh, the European uh, Union for funding this work uh, in the frame of the EU Dialogue Project, which has uh, the objective to facilitate exchange on climate policy of, uh, uh, options, expertise, and good practices with, uh, between the EU and other countries. And I, I think that's exactly what we, we, what we do here and what we enable also with this event um, because the recording will be then available online later um, for others to, to follow. Good news is um, we have an agenda. First, we will start with an uh, intro and background from Soran Mersman. Soran Mersman, the project lead for this project at the Berlin Governance Platform. We will continue with snapshot, snapshot country assessment from, uh, uh, from, the, from the countries, Argentina, um, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and the EU, and all, and followed by a, a reaction by, by governments and, and a discussion on, on the panel and with the, with the audience. And after the session, we will uh, allow for a more in-depth discussion for the countries using the posters and all also will be available um, to for this um, after the session. And with that, it remains, and we'll give the floor to the floor then. Hello, everybody. I will just move here so uh, the people online can actually also see me. And um, welcome everybody online and offline to, to our event. Uh, just a very quick overview about who we are. Uh, we are Climate Transparency. We are a network of 14 organizations uh, of, of and within the G20 
um, plus because we also have Colombia in the room for this project. So we are 330 plus now. <laughs> and um, we published an annual independent stock take of climate action of the G20. Uh, last one came out last winter. Um, and we provide concise, comparable, comprehensive information for communication and learning uh, and assessment, including NDC ambition, uh, policy outcomes, and policy implementation. Um, yes. So uh, about this project, uh, thanks again for, for the EU and the EU Climate Dialogues project to, uh, uh, to fund this pilot project. We, uh, um, uh, we will do a, or we are doing an implementation check on uh, existing climate policies, uh, how they are being implemented, what the status is, and uh, how well implementation is working. Uh, we are doing this in the transport sector um, for these five countries. And um, we do this because the transport sector is one of the most important sectors uh, in terms of decarbonization. 23% uh, 20, of global emissions in 2020 uh, came from uh, transport alone, and uh, three quarters of that uh, was road transport. And that's why we also focus mostly on road in this project. Um, so uh, the GST will show what's known, but uh, um, it will not show uh, on a granular level what uh, sectors and countries have done and uh, what they still need to do. And this is where we come in uh, because we think that effective implementation is key to realize potential. We need to learn from each other and that's why we need some information on what has gone well and what has, what has not. So um, we look at transport policies in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and the EU to find commonalities, challenges, opportunities to work together. Um, importantly, we do not look at uh, the climate performance, but really the policy performance of uh, these selected policies. Um, see, does this work? Somebody needs to. Okay, so um, just just as a quick overview, how we uh, uh, complement the global stock take. Uh, the global stock take does ask for uh, the status of climate policy implementation, but only on a global scale. As I already said, um, the NDCs of countries um, focus on future ambition, but not less present, not so much present day implementation. Um, and the NDC implementation is dependent on the implementation of the sector of policies to overall go and to reach the overall goals, and that's where we come in. Um, because we we ask our national policies implemented in a way that leads to the intended results. So um, the check assesses and provides learnings about implementation status of sectoral policies uh, using this wonderful sector symbol that I will explain in a second. Um, we have a quite easy to use um, concept, not necessarily oversimplified, but it is relatively easy to, uh, to use in principle. Uh, back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and it offers independent uh, assessments. What, what is happening? <laughs> okay. Uh, it offers independent assessments by in-country experts for selected national policy. And um, if you want to download the full methodology, then please go to our website or just use the QR code provided here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so just the check in a nutshell, we have four uh, categories, legal status, institutions and governance, resourcing, and oh, another resourcing, <laughs> this is wrong. Um, the, the other one should be oversight. Um, and uh, we rate these four categories and come to, click please, uh, then basically an overall rating. So only one of these uh, these segments will be shown for the different uh, um, uh, and the, the different categories, let's say. So you you will have front runner, uh, strong, medium, or weak, or not rated in certain uh, in certain areas. Um, if you want to know more about about the methodology, please do uh, approach us separately. Okay, next one, please. So. Um, 
coming now to the actual results because we also want to have time to discuss a little bit. We will do this in a, a short form. We will only uh, show one of our results per country very quickly. And uh, we will start with Brazil, with William Wills, um, then move over to Colombia, to uh, uh, Juliana Zinegas, uh, um, then to Mexico, to Mariana Gutierrez-Gangados, uh, to Argentina, then uh, uh, with Gabriel Blanco, who will join us on the online, and then go back to myself for the EU, and I will also present some cross-cutting findings. So thank you all, and um, I will now give over. Well, I'm going back to it. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. My name is William Wills. I'm a senior researcher at Centro Clima at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And this work was done with uh, some colleagues from the transportation uh, program, also from the University of Rio, Dr. Daniel Schmidt and Dr. George Goyd. So the title here is Beyond Biofuels in Brazil. Here, Brazil is well known by the use of biofuels in the transport sector for ethanol, also now for biodiesel. And uh, we will explore uh, beyond that. Next slide, please. OK, so building the, the foundation for the technological transition in the automotive industry. First, the Brazilian NDC target is to reduce 50% its emissions by 2030 in relation to 2005 and to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Our NDC is being revised. It was announced by the president last week and this week. And uh, probably it's going to be changed, but for now, that's what we have in the last update. Biofuels account for 23% of the energy consumption in the transport sector and electricity only for 0.3 percent for now but emissions intensity of the transport sector in brazil is below the g20 average so apparently it's a good indicator but we are not efficient at all diesel accounts for 45 percent of energy consume consumption in the sector and fossil fuels for 76 percent something like that but still 92% of our transport sector is made passenger transport sector is passenger transport is made by road and 59 59 of private transport goes by road also so we are not sufficient at all in a country that is really big almost half of South America uh, electric vehicles make up only 0.46% of car sales now we are a middle income country. Uh, those kinds of, of vehicles are still expensive for Brazilian population. So that's why we are a bit behind those countries right now. So uh, what we think is the biggest uh, opportunity right now is the electrification of uh, public transport. So in order to stay within the 1.5 limit, passenger and private transport needs to be decarbonized. Some recent developments, emission standards successfully implemented, and cars uh, reached the target level in 2022. And between 2021 and 2022, natural gas power and battery, battery electric urban trucks increased by 200% in, in those years. So these are good news. Next slide, please. So here we have the, this RUT 2030, Rota 2030, uh, which is a program uh, that is a tax incentive instrument aimed at promoting research and development projects within the Brazilian automotive industry. The progress is evaluated and specifications are reviewed in a five-year basis up to 2032. And the main focus is to enhance energy efficiency, structural performance, and the availability of assistive technologies. The program incorporates well-defined criteria and implementation mechanisms. Uh, those are the obligations, enrollment in the Brazilian vehicle labeling program, which is not obli obligatory in Brazil, 
verification of a minimum level of energy efficiency, verification of a minimum level of structural performance, and incorporation of safety for use assistive technologies. Uh, it's covering a bit the last topic there, but is uh, what is planned for the future to increase uh, the target of energy efficient. And also uh, there is a bill proposed to accept electric and hybrid vehicles from import taxes. So that's where we are right now. I'll pass the word to Florian or Mariana. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, hello, good afternoon, good morning in the other side of the world. Um, my name is Juliana Arciniegas. I am director of the Global uh, Stock Tech Project at Transforma. Perhaps for context, Transforma is a think tank based in Bogota, Colombia, but working together with many other countries of the Latin American region in supporting countries, governments, private sector, and other stakeholders in accelerating those climate and ecological transitions that we're talking about. So very happy to be here and thanks for the invitation to, to, trans, to climate transparency. Um, let, me, let me first say that this um, is a very uh, convenient moment for having this conversation because the transport section has a huge potential in terms of mitigation and adaptation with co-benefits on different sectors. And, uh, we're really expecting that the global stock take will consider this as part of the outcomes of COP28. Uh, but for the case of, um, of, of the electrification of public transport uh, on our country, uh, we believe that this is the bedrock for sustainability, uh, for sustainable mobility, as it has uh, an impact, as I said, in many fronts, um, not only for climate, but also for health and many other aspects. So uh, for general context, in, in Colombia, the transport sector is mainly led by diesel internal combustion engines. Um, and in 2018, the transport sector was responsible for around 12.5% of our greenhouse gas emissions and demands approximately 40% of the total generated energy. So um, Colombia has, a, has an economy-wide NDC, and each sector is requested to define different targets and plans to implement NDCs. And of course, as part of this national effort, the adoption of electric vehicles is an important part of uh, our strategy to reduce emissions and to, to meet the NDCs and the long-term strategies goals. So in, in, in these plans, we have that electric, uh, electric mobility is expected to reduce around 4 million tons of CO2 equivalent um, greenhouse gases in 2030 through the reach of 600,000 registered electric vehicles as part of our national strategy on electric mobility. And for mass public transportation systems, the, the government has established very specific uh, targets, if you see in time, so the idea is to reduce, uh, to, to, to increase uh, the share of electric vehicles in 10% by 2025, in 20% by 2027, in 40% by 2029, 60 by 2031, okay, and in the end we expect to reach 100% in 2035, so it's definitely a very ambitious target that the country has set for itself um, to advance in, in, in the NDC and the long-term strategy. And although the Colombian uh, policy covers both public and private sector, um, transport sector, there are more specific objectives, as I just said, for the public sector. And we actually believe that the public sector is the one that catalyzes um, through different incentives and standards um, the work for the private sector. So um, the Colombian electric, electric mobility law that we, that we chose for this um, assessment is the law 1964. It is the first electric mobility law that has the objective to promote sustainable, sustainable mobility through tax reductions, special parking spots, and other incentives for electric vehicles. And in assessing those components that uh, we just uh, heard about, 
in terms of legal and institutional basis, as well as finance and um, follow up and, and implementation. Uh, we found that this is um, a robust instrument. Of course, there are things to be improved in it, but we have a robust legal basis for the implementation of the policy with uh, very concrete mandates uh, for the different institutions to carry out uh, the implementation of, of the law. Then uh, we have very clear targets and objectives that are transparent, containing this schedule that I just referred to in terms of reaching the 100% by 2035. Uh, however, for example, we found, we found out that the policy lacks withdrawal dates for internal combustion public vehicles, so it's just focused on increasing the share of electric vehicles, but not, uh, not addressing that other part of um, the challenge. Um, and then um, it doesn't have any, any budgetary implications or considerations that would be important and that we've seen that um, it's part of what should be addressed not only at the national but also at the local level though, to have specific budgets for its implementation in time. And then, um, and it's great to have this evaluation in part because we don't have any evidence of publicly available information on the results of the implementation of the law. So although we are seeing the transformation in the country, we don't have any specific uh, monitoring and evaluation system that is public and that is available. And this is why having this independent assessments is so important. So I will leave it here and happy to answer any questions. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. So this is Mariana Gutierrez uh, from Mexico's Climate Initiative, ICM. Um, so just a few words about ICM. ICM is a uh, think tanking, um, re-granting, advocating, and project uh, implementing organization in Mexico. And um, so first of all, I would like to thank Climate Transparency for um, coordinating the elaboration of this assessment and also organizing this, this event. Also, uh, thanks, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank Ana Luz Presbitero, who is also co-author of this assessment and ICM's uh, energy program for their feedback and guidance. And last but not least, also thank to the International Council on Clean Transportation, uh, El Poder del Consumidor and SEMDA, uh, who provided inputs and feedback to this assessment. So um, the next one, please. Yeah, so when looking at um, transport sector in Mexico, um, so the transport sector is the second largest source of emissions. Um, it contributes with one fifth of national GHG and the automotive sector is in fact the leading em emitter of, uh, of the sector emissions and mainly light passenger vehicles and heavy freight and passenger vehicles contribute with 95% of uh, sector's emissions. And among the different alternatives to advance decarbonization uh, in, the, in the sector, updating transport sector's regulatory framework, uh, framework and making it more stringent is a first necessary and urgent step uh, for Mexico to comply with its climate commitments. Um, the, the two standards that we assessed in the, um, this time are related to two crucial uh, policies included in Mexico's NDC. So, um, and in fact, the, the discussions concerning their upgrade and uh, the, their stringency has been delayed uh, for more than a decade. So, um, in fact, uh, uh, in particular, NOM 163, is, which is related to fuel efficiency and CO2 emissions in light vehicles, is the most cost-effective uh, measure with the highest mitigation potential uh, of all Mexico's uh, portfolio of policies because it would contribute to reduce around 20 million tons of CO2 emissions by 2030. And NOM 044 um, aims to reduce um, air pollutant pollutants, including black carbon. Um, the next slide, please. 
So uh, that, uh, re very recently, the Economic and Environment Ministries announced uh, the update to NOM 163. Um, further analysis are required, but the level of ambition of, of this NOM was reduced by half. Uh, it is expected that, that this NOM will be in force um, during the first semester of 2024. And um, in fact, there will be a consultation phase during the coming months, and uh, um, it will apply to 2025 uh, model vehicles. So the design of uh, this specific standard needs to be carefully reviewed because it includes a set of facilities for automakers that results in loss uh, of effectiveness of around 30 percent of emissions and it also discourages uh, technological change so um, besides the lack of ambition of of this standard there are other institutional arrangements and policy measures that need to be carried out to actually guarantee the implementation of and compliance of both the standards so, of course, both uh, standards need to be updated and made uh, and make more um, made more stringent. And second, we also need a public and updated monitoring uh, mechanisms because um, there is a lack of evaluation of progress, and um, which restricts uh, the informed involvement of uh, stakeholders. And second, we also need to make sure that the implementing bodies are well resourced because the agency that is in charge of guaranteeing compliance of both standards um, has had budget cuts of over the last 10 years. Um, so that would be it from my side, but happy to answer any question. And now, Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we now move on to Gabriel, who is joining us online. Gabriel, are you there? We will. Yes, uh, ah, yes, perfect. I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Thanks. OK, well, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, all organizers, uh, for inviting me to present in, in this event. Uh, I'm uh, Gabriel Blanco. Uh, I work at the National University in Argentina, Universidad Nacional del Centro, and happy to be here to just to present briefly what, what's going on in Argentina regarding the, the transport sector. So if we can move to, to the first slide, the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so as, as in most um, Latin American countries, the transport sector here in Argentina is highly dominated by road transport, mainly powered by fossil fuels, uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, and compressed natural gas. Uh, that means that the uh, transport sector is, is, main, is the main source of emissions in the country, uh, reaching 14% of total emissions in the country, about 50 megatons of CO2 equivalent. And so, it, again, a, a major source of, uh, of emissions in, in Argentina, as it, as it is in, in almost every country, at least in Latin America. Uh, at, at, in, the, in the big cities or in the large cities in the, in the country, uh, again, uh, passengers uh, use uh, cars to move around, even though we, we do have some transport, trans, uh, public transportation in big cities, still passengers choose uh, to move around in, in individual cars that uh, creates a problem not only for emissions but all kind of uh, problems with the transit uh, and, and, and things like that but we do have uh, um, an, an action plan it's a, it, in, in, in 2017 it was released the first action plan on transport and climate change with a number of measures to be implemented in the near future that plan was updated in April uh, this year, so two months ago, with, an, uh, with a certain um, uh, ambition tar uh, or targets, goals, well, mm -hmm. but, you know, quite am am ambitious, I would say. And, and that was uh, indicated not only in the NDC, but now in the, what we call here the, the Climate Change National Plan. 
so, so that plan includes reducing emissions, of course, but not only that, but uh, to move from a more sustainable transport sector. So, so the goal is to reduce 15 megatons out of the 50 megatons that I mentioned before. And, and, and that plan includes, as a, one of the major part of the plan is to, to shift mod, model, transport models. Uh, from from ground transportation or from road transportation to other kinds of modes, so so that's um, that's a big part of it. So the the next slide, um, in the next slide, I I I, I show just uh, just one of these these measures. There are a number of measures again in the NDC, but mainly now in the in this climate change national plan, a number of measures dealing with the transport sector, and we decided to present today this uh, non-motorized mobility program which, which we believe is, is, is a little bit different uh, and it's interesting to at least to present briefly now um, again it's, it's a big part of the of, of the plan to move uh, from from the use of cars and other another modes of transport to non-motorized mobility uh, and in and there is a, a resolution that as a as a um, as a regulatory support for this, it's a, it's a resolution. It's not a law. It's just a resolution. So, so we need to move, uh, you know, strongly on this and, and 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 convert this resolution that comes from one ministry to to a national law. Uh, but it's still, we are not still there. So, and and this uh, this program uh, pursues the development of infrastructure uh, for for non motorized mobility in. in cities in, in medium-sized cities and large cities and of course this this program will require institutional strengthening uh, and of course it it, it, it will need uh, uh, a budget allocation for that there is some provision for budgetary allocation uh, for this program but it's, it's difficult to monitor it's difficult to monitor the pro the progress of the program, the, the, the level of implementation. So that's why we we sort of uh, rate this program at least so far as a, as a medium implementation. And the, the rate the rating of the of the implementation would be medium, but uh, still interesting and happy to to listen from you comments or question if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gabriel, that was really nice and uh, good that this hybrid format is actually working. Uh, so, uh, okay, moving on uh, to the EU, um, I will go through it quickly. Um, I call it the road to zero emissions and the infrastructure to go there. Next slide, please. Um, if it works, okay. So, uh, just as a very quick, uh, quick overview, we will we will have. A little bit more on on the EU later on by somebody who's much more knowledgeable than me. So um, I was focusing on the transition to zero uh, to zero emission cars and vans um, uh, in in the vein of the EU target of minus 55 percent overall emissions by um, by 2030 versus 1990 and climate neutrality by 2050, as is enshrined in the EU Green Deal. Um, and uh, in terms of EU current road transport emissions, uh, it's actually more than a quarter in 2020, and I think it's still about the same. Um, it's, uh, it's the highest emitting sector uh, by a little bit, but still the high, highest emitting sector in the EU. Um, and since the beginning of the year, we now have a new EU target for cars and vans uh, to, to, for new vehicles uh, to emit uh, more more than 50 percent uh, versus 20 or less than uh, versus 2021 and 2030 and even minus 100 percent uh, by 2035 so effectively that would mean a decarbonization a full decarbonization of the new vehicle fleet within 12 years so it's it is quite uh, quite ambitious which is also why the eu uh, has been rated overall as having an ambitious transport goal um, but uh, as we cannot, of course, look into the future, we have looked into the past and have looked at what were important policy elements to actually get there. And uh, what we need is clear signals to manufacturers through evolving emission standards. So we looked at regulation EU 2019-631, which is uh, 
the CO2 emission standard for cars, the uh, for Europeans famous 95 grams per 100 kilometers, uh, which, would, which was reached uh, in 2021, so right on time for cars, not uh, the same target or the, a little bit higher target for vans was not quite reached, but uh, almost, so we were almost on point. Uh, the next thing um, uh, was, and that's what I was going, and what I'm going to talk about, the EU-wide expansion and harmonization of infrastructure for charging, and of course also also other alternative fuels, which includes uh, uh, natural gas and compressed natural gas, uh, which is the Alternative Fuels Implementation Director, or AFID, or technically Directive 2014-94 EU. So it was, it is from 94. And uh, the last component that would be needed to phase that in, of course, are end user incentives, but they are not regulated on EU level, so we did not look at those. Um, yeah, as I said, the emission standard was successfully implemented. Um, we rated it as a front runner, and for those people who are in the room, they can take a look at the detailed ratings in the back here later at the poster sessions. The infrastructure development was also um, was also implemented successfully, but still only had limited impact. And uh, that's what I was going to talk about next. Thanks. Um, so the implementation rating is strong, but uh, um, uh, the ambition would only be medium uh, because uh, the AFIR, uh, the AFIT, uh, only uh, provides a general framework for, for uh, infrastructure development with EU member states very much in the driver's, uh, driver's seat. We have clear rules, um, but what we don't have, and that, what, that is what limits the uh, um, climate effectiveness, is clear targets on what the infrastructure should look like. So we only have an indicative target uh, of, uh, I think it's, and it's one charging station per 10 cars, but it's only indicative. So it was very, uh, it was implemented very differently by, by the different member states. We also have a quite complex governance structure with who is responsible for what. Um, and the result is that we have a quite uneven infrastructure deployment with some overachievers, but also quite a lot of underachievers. Um, but what is really good is uh, the monitoring and evaluation system. Um, there was a very, very detailed uh, uh, impact assessment in 2021, which uh, led to a lot of learnings that fed into the regulation that we have now. Um, so um, that brings me to the learnings already. So just from uh, for the, the implementation check itself, what we observe is that for all the policies we look at, the legal basis is actually sound. Um, that is to be expected because uh, policies usually are grounded in laws, um, only sometimes they aren't, but mostly they are. Um, institutions and governance, of course, varies. Um, uh, the most medium ratings we got were for lack of transparency and also for lack of clarity of the rules. Um, and the most potential for improvement and learning from each other, actually, we see an oversight because um, many policies do not include integrated monitoring or evaluation systems, which, of course, limits the potential for, uh, for learning from, from past ways of doing it, for doing it differently, hopefully better in the future. Um, and resources, again, it really depends on, on what kinds of policies you, ha you have. Um, but it is very hard to actually gauge that from the outside because most of the resources for policies are actually included in operational bu budgets of the implementing in uh, institutions, which makes it really hard to, to really see um, what the actual budget for each and every policy is. Um, so again, as I said, we're not looking at climate uh, performance, but we look at policy performance. So. Uh, um, we have three, well, we have more, but we have three main findings um, that uh, I have put in some questions, so to say, which is who needs to do what by when, which uh, by which I mean you need to clearly state the responsible institutions and uh, clarify the governance to maximize the effectiveness of a policy. Um, then 
in terms of monitoring and evaluation, what has worked, what do we learn, and how do we make it better? Um, again, uh, I think learning uh, in the policy cycle is one of the most important things to, to improvements. So um, uh, if, if that is not included directly in the policies, it is certainly good to have a general monitoring system and um, the, the clearer it is for each and every policy, the better. Um, and another learning that came out basically from the sidelines, but with, which also is very important, I think, is um, what has worked for you that I can make, make work for me, um, which is basically how can we learn in a country and also across countries. Um, so what we found is that uh, high level, strategic level policies uh, that then have basically trickled down into regions or also in the case of the EU based member states, of course. Um, they profit from, uh, from a dialogue process between the countries um, and uh, between the regions and um, uh, the, the different towns actually sometimes even. So um, that is very helpful and um, Again, thanks to the EU Climate Dialogues who make that happen, and uh, that's basically in their DNA, so it's a good, basically, finding to turn that around again. So um, with that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, since we are in the international uh, domain, um, we wanted to, to take a look, an outlook, so to say, on ambition implementation and the international process. So. Um, just in terms of um, what we, sorry, um, what we do here is uh, we look at implementation, um, but of course implementation needs to follow ambition. Um, ambition needs to be first, um, national governments need to set the ambitious targets and then implement them. Um, there is Again, you cannot have one without the other, um, but uh, ambition comes definitely first. Um, again, if we want to connect implementation and ambition, um, it is mostly through the learning process and the policy cycle. Um, if we have successful implementation of policies, um, it is especially important that this then moves into further ambition from the learnings to, to set uh, attainable, but again, uh, ambitious goals. And um, on the international level, of course, the, uh, um, the enhanced transparency framework that is being discussed, not this time, but at COP28, it will be again, I'm pretty sure. Um, it requires countries to report on progress made towards NDC goals, but uh, um, mostly on a national level, again. Um, but the NDC process depends on effective sector sharp policy implementation, um, because without it, uh, we don't know how the, uh, how the NDC actually has worked. Um, and that, again, coming back to the beginning, is where we step in uh, monitoring tools like ours. Even, even if they are simple and quick, they can help to, uh, to gauge where we are with NDCs and where we are going and um, help in the global stock take and in the next round. So thank you. Um, this is basically our, our project, but we now move on to interest, more interesting things or even more interesting things with Sebastian. No, it's, it's not my floor. I think the floor is now to our distinguished uh, representative from, from the governments. So what I take away here is that, yeah, ambition and implementation is not the same as you have seen in the ratings of the, um, of the, the maps and the uh, detailed implementation ratings presented afterwards, but they necessarily need to go uh, with each other uh, side by side. And that's also the motivation for our reactions from, from our government representatives. And I want to like to invite uh, and welcome again Mr. Aloisio de Mello from Brazil. He's the Director of, for Mitigation, Adaptation, Implementation at the Ministry of Environment um, to join also um, the panel. And as well, um, we have here Diana Barba. Uh, she's Senior Advisor um, for Climate Change and International Relations, uh, International Negotiations under the UNFCCC 
in the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia. And as well, we have uh, Gustavo Rinaldi um, joining us uh, online after a long, long flight from, from Barcelona, 40, 14 hours. He just arrived in, in, in Argentina. Um, and I hope that he's there. He's the Director of Environment uh, Impact of Transportation in Argentina of the Ministry of Environment of uh, Argentina. And um, last but not least, um, Carlo de Grandis, Policy Officer, DG Clima, Climate Action, Transportation and Mobility uh, in the European Commission. But I want to start with uh, you, Mr. Mello, um, to welcome you again um, and uh, to react um, uh, on our question, um, how can we ensure that the uh, ambitious NDCs are also and translated in uh, effective implementation? A question especially relevant after President Lula's announcement on, on Monday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Thanks for the invitation. Congratulations to Climate Transparency for the project and to the researchers uh, for the results they, they showed us. I think it's a very good moment for us in Brazil to engage in that discussion uh, because, uh, as, as mentioned, we are, uh, let's say, uh, putting a lot of efforts in the new government from the, gui the guidance of President Lula in, in terms of putting as a top level priority the climate policy in Brazil. I think you have seen since the first moments in government, not only President Lula, but also in, in not only Minister Marina Silva, but also other areas of government are, are putting the, the climate agenda in a, a very high level in their sector policies, in cross-cutting policies such as the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Industry and Trade, and many other areas. In fact, we have, uh, as President Lula says, we have we see the climate agenda as part of the broader development agenda in Brazil in a very specific way in terms of the opportunities for the country to uh, increase, uh, to generate employment in terms of pushing innovation, moving the sectors towards the, the green or climate agenda. So uh, I think we have a very uh, general view on the importance and the opportunities in the agenda. One way we can uh, we can see that is that we have now something like 17 ministries. We have a lot of ministries there, 34, I think. But about half of them have specific areas for climate change in many different sectors, in social, economic, in other sectors. So they have specific, explicit mandates. And besides that, the other ministries also have their policies and instruments related to mitigation or adaptation. So one of the challenges, so you might imagine, is the governance in this new context with, uh, let's say, many stakeholders, many different policies uh, addressing mitigation or adaptation uh, with specific approaches and targets. So one of the first measures that something that government, uh, President Lula announced last Monday is the reestablishment of the uh, the interministerial committee on climate change, bringing together those ministries. Uh, this is for the federal government to be, let's say, very uh, integrated and to make the the, uh, the main definitions regarding to the NDC, to the policies, to the implementation. So we, as a minister of minister of environment, we are the secretary of this committee. Is coordinated. The president of the committee is the chief of the civil cabinet in the presidency. So it's a high, very high level committee. And besides that, a new instrument, which is a National Council on Climate Security, which is being designed to bring together civil society, private sector. And we have three levels, three levels of government in Brazil. So this multi-level, uh, multi-stakeholders uh, council to make the, let's say the main uh, uh, agreements on the climate agenda. And besides that, we are discussing a new agency 
to make the monitoring. And so this addresses one of the main issues and recommendations here, the monitoring of the progress of the of the policies in the different sectors, but also an agency to make excellent exposed assessments on the effectiveness of the proposals and on the effectiveness of the policies that are part of the national policy of climate change. So this is the new governance infrastructure that we are putting together right now. And I think uh, the other important element of the contest as we have this the review of the national the NDC. In fact, what President Rule announced on Monday is much more an amendment because we have two changes in the NDC made by the last government in two moments. So it's much more to say, okay, we go, we are going to bring back the original ambition of our NDC in terms of the absolute uh, target in 2030, 1.2. Uh, billion tons of CO2. So despite changing the, the percentage, the, with the, we could meet with the same absolute target. So that's what he mentioned. And uh, besides that, I think we are bringing back the, the ministry, the, the ministries and the policies to see where we are in terms of implementing our, our NDC. Uh, in which sectors we advance the most, in which sectors we need to go further. We can we see that some areas has, uh, have advanced and some areas such as uh, what William presented have, have very clear uh, uh, policies in terms of the legal, the, 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 the coordination and the implementation. But in some areas, there is a lot of uh, things that could be uh, done better. So bringing together this these ministries and have very clear implementation this this uh, I, sometimes i say it's a kind of a domestic stock take that we need to make and then to redefine what are the commitments to get the to the, the 2030 target i think it's the main uh, the main uh, challenge we have uh, right now so i think it's a very good let's say approach very simple objective approach that you take it you have taken in this uh, project to to uh, give us, uh, uh, I think, something that we can use to see how effective and how, let's say, well structured are those uh, strategies in the different sectors. One more point I would add on that: something that we should do is to revise the alignment of the policies in each sector, because we have all those policies that there. Are uh, explicitly intend to deliver a mitigation target, but these policies work together with many others that are addressing other objectives. So I think one challenge we have is to make a version of assessment and try to improve policy alignment in the different sectors. So thank you. Sorry. Thank you, um, Mr. Mello, for the mic and also for the good presentation. <laughs> and I have one other question for you, but before I, I raise that question, I want to give the opportunity to uh, Diana Barba to respond to that question. So how do you uh, make sure that uh, the NDCs are also implemented with ambitious um, policies in Colombia? They both work. Um, yeah, thanks for, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and the, and the, the, just the results of, of, of this assessment are very interesting because we need this information also for um, not only um, trying to enhance the policies that are at the moment are uh, Colombia implementing, but also to enhance the, because I, I want to uh, make a clarification on the, um, the, the evaluation of public policies in Colombia. Um, and maybe this this kind of independent assessment could improve this this uh, public uh, policies uh, evaluation. So the National Planning Department, there is a, a cross cutting uh, department uh, for planification in Colombia, uh, has a division for the monitoring and evaluation of public policies. And actually, the information is public. And this division tracks and uh, monitor the implementation of the public policies using uh, results and impacts indicators. But the problem is that, uh, for example, in the case of the 
law uh, 1940 uh, of uh, 2019, that is the uh, electric mo mobility, is, is, is very recent. So the, and I, I know it is five years ago, but it is uh, well, four, four years ago, but uh, at the, the enabling conditions to monitor the policies are not at the moment. Um, so, um, and I, I mean, in, in the government, so um, this independent um, assessment will be very uh, useful to uh, feedback, to have a feedback because uh, we see that this kind of system has this, these results and impact indicators, but uh, we need to enhance the system in order to re uh, reflect better the performance of the of the policy, the actual performance of the policy. So, and I guess to identify also uh, barriers uh, and gaps uh, because uh, for and and, and this is uh, why the, I link this clarification with that uh, we are uh, the, with with the importance of the independent evaluations and also what we are doing in Colombia. So. Um, I guess uh, this independent uh, assessment could also um, um, point out the barriers and the gaps and in order to improve the policies and the monitoring you know, and on the implementation of the policies and how will be the, the enabling conditions. Because one of the, the, the issues that we identify is that in, in this crucial decade, it will be very important to focus on the enabling conditions for the long-term transformation and the systemic transformation. And we see also that uh, for in order to uh, improve our or enhance our ambition, it is crucial to uh, maybe uh, decouple from this uh, vision on planning, uh, very uh, planning individual actions as silos. Is maybe it is better to have a planning uh, a planification based on a systemic transformation and for example in Colombia we have the um, 2050 strategy that is uh, a strategy that uh, includes the long-term uh, goals and the very strategic lines uh, in order to transform the economy in Colombia so uh, for example uh, it is um, crucial to uh, electric the electrifying the 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 our uh, economies I mean the, to change all fossil fuels uh, to a more uh, sustainable um, using of the energy, so uh, and the and the sources of the energy as well. So uh, and with with these systemic uh, li lines uh, and the, the more strategic lines, it will be uh, later um, uh, maybe reflected in uh, specific sectoral approaches and sectoral opportunities. Uh, so and, and this this also uh, allows to uh, not not concentrate to be concentrated in the short term because the NDCs uh, in the in the Paris Agreement there's a disconnection because the NDCs uh, there's a call for enhancing the NDCs but not in the light of the uh, long term goals of the other Paris Agreement so we we have all to 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 be conscious of that and. Um, I, I guess uh, also um, well uh, we are at the moment also we, we are uh, we, we have a challenge in this moment because we are translating our NDC on a carbon budget um, and it is it is more transparent type of NDC because it is we are uh, trying to to see how the uh, the cumulative emissions during the whole implementation period uh, are are. Uh, Evolution and also how to address these cumulative emissions and how to address uh, these cumulative emissions sec in a sectoral way. So uh, the the policies uh, the, it is it is more transparency uh, in is more transparent in order to assess the policies and how the policies actually uh, impact the cumulative emissions in Colombia. So this is a, a, a an exercise that maybe is finished at the end of this year. So yeah. Could, um, Stay tuned for that. <laughs> and and I, I, I have many things, uh, additional things to say, but I guess this is the, the most important thing that I have to. Thank you, uh, Ms. Barbara, for the very interesting input. And with that, we want to move to Mr. Rinaldi from the um, Ministry of Environment of Argentina. Um, Gustavo, are you there? Let's see. Until one second ago. Ah. I swear. Here 
<laughs> Gustavo, can you hear us? Gustavo? He's not connected to audio currently. Gustavo, you're not connected. Um, you may want to try it once again. Um, and uh, with that, we can move and fit in um, Mr. Carlo de Grandes. Mr. de Grandes, can you, can you hear us? From the European Commission. Hello. Yes, yes we yes, can hear you. Can hear you. Uh, unfortunately, my video is stopped. Uh, if you can provide it, I can. Otherwise, I can just speak. So, yeah. okay. You yes, have the now I can. slide ready. So, in case you can share it or you want no us problem, to show? I can share it. Okay, please go ahead. So, let me just go to it. Share. You cannot start the video. Okay, seems the okay. Yes, now it's been sharing. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Great. So, in principle, in the case of the European Commission, it all started setting um, high-level uh, goals, which are still to be translated in terms of countries' uh, um, uh, contributions, but. Uh, uh, the overall ambition was to go for a uh, revise upward uh, uh, previous uh, commitment pledges and going to minus 55%, so a steeper a decarbonization uh, rate of 15% uh, higher for 2030, and uh, in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, in this framework, uh, uh, transport, which you described before, it's uh, above one quarter of our total emission, 75% of which road, but what is worse is the sector which has not managed to reduce actually uh, its emission from 1992, uh, just before the pandemics. Then it was bouncing a bit, but that's clearly something abnormal. Therefore, according to this principle and considering uh, all the um, different sector potential for reduction uh, and the set of uh, tool, existing tools to be revised, a comprehensive uh, uh, roadmap and a set of measures was defined, the Fit for 55, which entails a, mis a mix of standards, uh, targets, uh, like yes, also overall uh, reduction, uh, tarification, market-based instrument like uh, the emission trading scheme and uh, system and so on and so forth. Now, many of these influence directly or indirectly transport. And you see in this picture, the blue and pale blue ones are the ones which actually have a direct influence on transport, either at sectorial level. So we have refuel you for the aviation, fuel you for the maritime. So how to change, uh, uh, let's say, the overall, the overall the, uh, for instance, wealth wake uh, or uh, energy efficiency on board for planes and ships. Uh, we have a revision of the Energy Taxation Directive, uh, a new uh, emission trading uh, system for road and buildings, uh, whose revenues will be uh, conveyed into a climate social fund exactly to favor and make the transition possible for those in need in terms of uh, uh, energy and transport poverty. So how to make it affordable? Direct in direct, it's not a matter of substituting car, one car with another necessarily, but using all the tools, including collective transport, etc., in order to decrease the actual contribution in terms of emission. Uh, and then we have three specific tools which are redefining uh, notably the world of the road, transport, and the automotive. Uh, one of which was not formally 50 or 55 because it came one year later, but I'll mention it as it has just already been launched by the Commission and it, it's due to start uh, our trilateral negotiations called trilogues with the two co-legislators, the Parliament and the Council. So in this framework, we have uh, CO2 emission standards for light duty vehicles or cars and vans, which define a trajectory of uh, decarbonization in terms of uh, CO2 emissions per kilometers per vehicle a long time concerning the new vehicles. This is not to be addressed by member state, but at uh, manufacturer level. So it, it concerns any each and any uh, actor in the automotive sector in order to produce a fleet which is more and more decarbonized. 
mixing uh, zero emission vehicles, low emission vehicles, and conventional vehicles. And the ultimate goal is to go for, well, 20, uh, 2030, having already 55% of the new cars as a minimum for each manufacturer uh, being uh, uh, zero emission and 50% uh, of the runs. And at 2035, having only zero emission vehicles being uh, introduced in the market. Whilst uh, for heavy duty vehicles, the standard was uh, uh, increased to minus 45% at 2030 and uh, zero for the new urban buses at 2030 to uh, go aggressively uh, towards a decrease at minus 90% for the overall sector at 2040. Uh, but to do this, not only we have the measures we, which I was saying in terms of uh, taxation of fuels and uh, providing support to those like, who are actually affected, including micro enterprises by energy poverty, but you have also a specific action at European level, so at if you wish, quasi federal level, to ensure that we have a, avail an available infrastructure for zero emission vehicles, basically electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel vehicles available across member state in the, uh, the whole infrastructure, common infrastructure, which we call Trans-European Transport Network, which is anyhow some 60,000 kilometers of roads, uh, in the case of roads across the 27 member states, plus specific targets in terms of uh, public refueling stations at level of member state, according to the fleet of zero emission vehicles, notably electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles, in order to have a sufficient power when installed for public charging, plus hydrogen refueling station, and that all at level of, uh, uh, again, trans-European transport network, level of uh, urban nodes. We have 430 urban nodes, which belongs to the 20 urban nodes for which this uh, uh, provision is mandated. We talk about fast, uh, in this case, uh, charges, not the normal charges, which are done at home at quarter level, and uh, uh, hydrogen refueling station. And this provision in terms of recharging infrastructure applies also to all the main safe and secure parking areas along 10 t which are a sort of a, a stepping tool for, uh, for trucks uh, in order to either spend the night or the uh, mandatory rest time uh, after 4.5 hours of driving. Uh, so the idea is to provide, to ensure that as long as the, the fleet develops, as long as there is an incentive for a producer to come with competitive solutions, because these vehicles have to be not produced, but sold. So they have to come with something which is appealing for the market. And, uh, the infrastructure is also there and that we develop the, the overall ecosystem and the scale economies which are needed in order to have these zero emission vehicles uh, reaching in a competitive way the market and progressively substituting uh, according to the industrial transition uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. So this is the main uh, broad line of my introduction on the, let's say how, how we want to reach it. Uh, being regulations, these are defined at the European uh, level and do not require a transposition by member states, but member states can allocate resources. Notably, we see important multi-billion programs uh, in member states with often EU funds in order to provide uh, support to the automotive sector for the transition uh, to trigger investment up to 4.7 billion euros in the case of Spain. Uh, just to put an example, supported with the so-called recovery plan, we have ad hoc funding for the infrastructure provided at European level, at national level in uh, uh, national and European fund uh, uh, devolved to countries, but also in terms of, for instance, of alternative fuel infrastructure facility. Every six months, we assess all projects submitted together with a financial uh, operator and which have uh, a certain uh, co-funding rate but uh, and uh, return of investment but a certain funding gap and we provide this funding gap up to 25 percent of the cost of the project uh, at central level and we've already supported more than 20,000 charging points to quote an example for light duty vehicles in uh, less than two years so we see an appetite and market developing and we see a steering role but there will be national plans on the infrastructure side uh, to ensure that there is a consistency and that the deployment is effective and timely 
together with the uh, actual uh, evolving market of zero emission vehicles. This is the bulk of my presentation, of my points uh, on how we want to reach this road transport decarbonization. Thank you, Vitalik, on this, for this very interesting uh, input. And with that, we will move on to our last input and reaction from, from the Argentinian government, from uh, Mr. Gustavo Rinaldi. Gustavo, uh, can you hear us? He cannot. He's not. Uh, He's not online. He's, okay. He has been trying to connect several times, but I think he had issues. And okay. Then... So, um, Mr. Rinaldi has obviously uh, issues in uh, connecting. So, with that, um, I had some questions for you, but I, as we are already very, very advanced with, the, with our timing, I would give the opportunity to our audience here and also to the audience online to raise some questions. And if there's uh, space, I will jump with my questions in. So, um, our online audience, please collect your questions, send them in the chat, and my colleague uh, Zena Abbas uh, will. Um, identify them. Um, please also add your name in your affiliation. But I want to start here. Are there any questions in the room um, to either the authors or to our distinguished uh, government representatives regarding the presented information? Please state your name and affiliation in a short question. Yeah, hi, I'm Lukas Hamburg from the Roboter Institute in Germany. Thanks for the very interesting um, presentations. Um, I think my most urgent question is uh, related to intercity transport, long distance transport. All of the countries represented here are very large spaces and uh, not so much train networks operating at least not for passengers, if I'm correct. Um, you have long distance buses and obviously aviation, domestic flights. What's the strategy for decarbonizing this part of the transport patchwork. Uh, yeah, I'm just really curious to hear, because that's very different from where we are here in, in Europe and what we are experiencing when we are traveling through our continent. And I'm, I'm keen to hear what you, what's the plan there? Thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. Is there another question that's collected and then give it to the panel? Yes, I, I'm Madeleine Wen, I'm working for Miserio. I have a question of understanding. There was said at the call, there's a call of enhancing the NDC, but not in the light of the long term goal of the Paris Agreement. And I would really like to uh, dig deeper into it and understand what uh, exactly is meant by it. So thanks for these two questions. I would suggest that we take this question first. I think it was directed to you, uh, Mrs. Pava, and then um, move on with the question from, from Lucas Hamvilla on the uh, intercity and inter uh, uh, transportation. So please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I, 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 I try to maybe clarify that. Uh, I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to say that the price agreement per se has a long-term goals. And these long-term goals are uh, the umbrella, are, are, the, are the framework for all the um, articles in the Paris Agreement. But at the same time, if you see the, part, the Article 4, and you see uh, that uh, we have the, uh, the actually the, uh, the Article 4, Paragraph 1, that is the, uh, the frames that the, our goal of, of also reaching the, is the net zero uh, in the second part of the century, but at the same time, we have, uh, I, I remember in the, in the 410 or the 411 that um, calls countries to enhance their indices, but not in light exactly of the 1.5. And uh, we have also the uh, 419 uh, uh, that is uh, the fostering uh, countries to uh, elaborate their long term uh, strategies, but the, the low development strategies must not in light with the because low emissions strategy could be, uh, yeah, it, it depends on the country, but uh, it's not necessary a strategy to uh, achieve the net zero. It may be a strategy to achieve low emissions, but not the zero. So there is a, a, a kind of disconnection that we need to address in order to uh, formulate and enhance our indices in light of the ultimate objectives of the Paris Agreement. 
and they also they uh, to align their indices to their long term strategies. So we all we have all these elements in the Paris Agreement, but it's not a, a, an explicit connection on all of the elements. That's why. So th thanks for the, the answer and the uh, question from Mr. Hamler. I would like to give uh, first uh, the opportunity to uh, Mr. Meller to answer. And after that, um, maybe uh, Mr. De Grandis online, you, if you're interested, you could also say something um, for the EU. But first, um, Mr. Meller, please. Yes, in the case of Brazil, I think uh, the main instrument or two basic instruments we have. First, there's a national plan a national plan uh, of uh, transport infrastructure development, which said uh, midterm like or long term, 20 years uh, projection of the demands for freight transport, passenger transport, and what is the the needs and the projected infrastructure in the that period, and then what are the main investment? Basically, is about expanding in the transport infrastructure in uh, in some way changing uh, the models uh, basically from road to a uh, train and how to say that hydro or internal uh, river transport and on the coast the cabotage transport also so that means expanding uh, ports and infrastructure infrastructure sorry so this is the the mid long term plan and the second one is the investment plan which is sets the big uh, investment projects that are uh, the priorities uh, for the federal government either for direct investment from with government resources or for PPPs or with other means of implementation. So there's a list, a set of projects in the, let's say, the decarbonization of the whole transport matrix is one of the, let's say, criteria to prioritize these uh, infrastructure projects. So these are the main instruments and how to deal with, uh, how to, actually we have uh, this, uh, as other countries, I think the challenge to expand actually the, the transport infrastructure, but also to uh, try to improve uh, in the, the quality of the, the transportation and to reduce JG emissions and other associated impacts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gans, do, do you also want to uh, shortly respond to, a question, to the question? I can, but as I was saying, I had noise in the headsets. So the... That's... Uh, Thank you. The issue was uh, transport uh, decarbonization in general. Um, no, that if if you have not understood the question, let's let's. I would propose to to move on. Um, are there any um, questions from our digital audience? Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, one addition from the floor. Yes, I I would like. Um, yeah, I I'm not a, a transport expert, but I heard from my colleagues on the. Uh, and this implementation team and the long-term strategy that we have many scenarios in Colombia model and the, one of these scenarios is this long-term distance uh, but the, the, the most challenging thing is the freight, the freight transport um, so we see that it, it, because of the, uh, of the conditions of, of Colombia, Colombia is a mountain country so it is very difficult at the moment thinking how to move to an electric transportation so we this is this is the most challenging because we are trying to maybe move the all transportation to gas to to natural gas because but at the same moment at at, at the same time we are trying to see how the the, the um that the technologies advance in a way that we address this challenge. Uh, so it is important to also uh, to, to enhance ambition, to be very aware of the technology pathways and how the technologies are progressing in order to skip transitional uh, technologies. But in some cases, it's very difficult. And so this is that I learned from my um, uh, colleagues and, and experts of the, of the transport, so, but we are dealing with this challenge and we are aware of the of the challenge on, on that. 
Okay, thank you. Um, one question from our online audience. Um, one question to Mexico. Uh, you stated that the level of ambition of uh, the norm had been reduced by half uh, from 2018 to the update of May 2023. Could you elaborate on uh, what were the reasons for that? Sure, thank you. It is a very good question and difficult to answer because there is a lack of an open and transparent discussion concerning how the um, the, the, the two standards are defined. Um, so, in fact, concerning the NOM 163, it is very difficult to follow up the discussions as the normalization process involves uh, different ministries and, and their decentralized bodies, but I can say that uh, the, the NOM, uh, well, from my perspective, I think the NOM 163 has been co-opted by, by the private sector because despite the, the, the NOM uh, regulates emissions limit um, aligned to those of the USA and Canada, it also encourages the adoption of certain technologies that increase vehicle performance, but they are not supported by an actual uh, emissions reduction. Thank, thank you, Mariana. And with as we have started a little later, I want to um, ask for your permission to um, go a little bit over the uh, the half an hour after four. Um, and I want to close with uh, trying it again with Mr. Gustavo Rinaldi to get his input and then close with a question to all our panelists um, is um, what, how would a successful GST, a successful COP uh, this year look like for you? What do we need for this? Um, two sentences, you can think about it uh, in the meantime. And um, in the meantime, we try to get connected with Gustavo uh, Rinaldi again, who just landed from a long, long flight from Barcelona. Gustavo, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I, I, I feel so embarrassed because my, my connection, my internet connection is, is working really, really well. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's, but, that's no problem. Uh, Okay, uh, I would like to, to talk just a, a minute about what are we doing in Argentina about climate change and, and transport. You know, um, we, we have been working in the last two years about trying to, 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 to develop a plan, which is, uh, and, uh, sorry, I was reading the, the, what China was saying. I, we, will, we will be working in the last two years developing a plan who is consistent and who is solid about their objectives and about the, the way we get these objectives. Um, really, you know, Argentina is, is in the middle of a, a huge economic crisis. So it's not easy to think about buying new new vehicles or transforming the, the vehicles into electric. It's it's for us in these days it's really expensive. Uh, it's, it needs a lot of inversion. So it's not a, a possibility. I think that's why we are working about planning. We are highlighting the, the planning of the cities, trying to avoid unnecessary trips, trying to work in the um, developing the, 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 city, the city planification, the use of the land, the, the, tele, the tele work, uh, so we can avoid the, 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 the trips instead of, of thinking about, uh, about uh, Getting better than the, the the other the other thing of sustainable transport. Uh, we think about shifting about shifting to train to um, inland waters is the possibility Argentina has, uh, like the long hanging fruit uh, to start um, to start um, the the carbonization of, of transport and. 
by the other side, by the other side, we are very worried about the impact of climate change in the sports, not uh, only about decarbonization, but also about adaptation of cost transport. We are really worried about that. We we are seeing the effects of climate change in the in the transport these days. You know, we are in we are in June today, and there is 25 degrees here. So the, the thing is very worse and worse, and the transport is going to suffer that and, and is suffering that. So in one way, we are trying, we, we are not so focused on, uh, on buying new vehicles. We are focused on trying to shift to, to, better, to better modes, trying to plan better our cities. And on the other hand, we are trying to work in the in the adoption of, of the cities, adoption of the system of work. We we think that's that's the, the way. But really the, the challenge of the of the hour of, of these days is making that step from planning to action, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's it's really difficult in, in our countries uh, with our economic crisis. Uh, it's it's not easy and we can make the, the better plans, the best plans, but that step is is really is really difficult in, in Argentina. I I am available to any question, Florian, or any. I, I don't want to to take so much time because I am not in. I, I, we are late. Thank you, Gustavo Rinaldi, for for this very interesting input. I think which also shows that the that developing and developed countries have very different uh, means to to go ahead, and that shows. I mean, that's also um, a task for all of us, maybe in the in depth discuss discussions on how international cooperation, international finance can help um, uh, to bring this issue forward. And with that, um, I want um, our closing um, uh, question two sentences from from all of you and if you're prepared uh, gustavo you could start so how uh, would a successful gst or a cop 28 this year look like for you and what what does it need do you have uh, one or two sentences on this yeah uh, i can I, I i we have to, to get together the the south countries we have to work together the the region the latin americas uh, and the other south countries because the situation here is different in Europe. You know, uh, we have, I, I've been in, in Barcelona with some brothers from Africa and they have a, 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 very, a very different problematic about uh, climate change and, and transport. In Latin America, we have a really a different problematic than Africa and, and Europe. And uh, so we, we have to work in our particularities, our, our the, the things that our own characteristics and and try to work on that. Uh, for instance, in in Argentina, we have to try to 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 work with lithium, to work with with the uh, with the, the the production, the manufacturing of of batteries. Uh, we have industry. We have to to work on that so we can be part of the of the supply chain of electromobility. And at the end, that will help that will, ha will help our uh, our citizens to have better lives. And, and I think that's the that has to be our final point to to help people to to have better quality of, of life. And transport has to a lot of a lot to do about that. Thank you, um, Mr. Melo. Successful GST. Three points. Uh, First, creating the momentum for more ambitious NDCs. So we need that since this year or right now. Phasing out fossil fuels have a clear signal towards that. That's ambitious, I know. And uh, adaptation, focus on people, metrics, targets, resources for adaptation. I think this, there's an urgency that we should respond to. Um, yeah. We would like to see, um, well, to, to, to frame the outputs of the GSD on the long-term transformation, uh, not only the same, uh, I mean, the same thematic areas, adaptation mitigation. So we, as I like, um, we, in Colombia, we see that. And 
we would like to see very clear signals on systemic transformation and actors outside from the UNIPCCC uh, in regarding this need to uh, chance to have a transformation, for example, of the international financial system. And also, we agree with this uh, signal and this uh, a more a very very straightforward message for fossil uh, facing out the fossil fuels. Uh, and also uh, the, uh, the the way forward and a follow-up approach for the ESD will be very important in order to um, track uh, the, the recommendations from the GSD. So this is, I guess, we, we have other kind of uh, suggestions for, for um, ensuring the ambition of the GSD, but there are uh, resuming that. Thank you. In our view, a meaningful outcome of the GSD will be one that not only includes those transformational signals in decisions, but are also accompanied by concrete roadmaps on how to implement high-impact solutions, for example, in this sector uh, where we have seen there is, there is a huge potential in terms of, of reducing emissions and there are um, technologies and policies already available, so can ensure it's feasible in terms of implementation, of course, as Gustavo said, also considering a specific context of regions and sectors, but uh, providing those more concrete guidelines of, of work for each of the system transformations needed. Thank you. Well, um, I think that for COP28, um, we will see a global stock take quite similar to IPCC's assessment that, and, we, and that will also outline the uh, recommendations that countries need to, the policies that countries need to, to, to do to implement to actually achieve long-term Paris Agreement goals. And, um, yeah, and I would expect that also countries will turn their attention towards uh, having more transparent and accountable mechanisms to actually implement those policies. It's always difficult to be here at the end and, and say something in addition to all of the, that big list. Uh, but I would say that it would be very good if we could have until the end of the year global commotion and an ambition for all countries that is aligned with the climate emergency that we are facing and to align that also with climate finance and means of, of implementation. Thank you, William. And I can show you not at the end because we have uh, Gabriel Blanco and Mr. Tigranes online. Um, do you want to say and add something, Gabriel? Yeah, yeah, hello. Um, well, I don't know what to say about, about COP and the UNEP triple C process at this point. I don't have much expectations about, about the process. Um, so so what I can say is I hope that the, the process uh, uh, come back to what the, the original purpose and uh, to, to, to set up collaboration among countries. And, and this is this is basically what what can I expect uh, or what, what I can hope actually. Uh, but uh, I agree what what Gustavo said about about uh, dealing with uh, particularities in different regions, countries, and and the need to implement what is best for each region and country without rushing, you know, behind any particular technology or any any particular solution coming from from other places I and mean, each each part of the world should look at for the best solution in this case for transport uh, for the transport sector and and I fully agree that we need to establish sort of a sort of a, a, a priority a, a, a pyramid of priorities reducing trips in the first place reducing vehicles on this in the street and, and and then start looking for uh, for changes in in, in in fuels and technologies etc so so we need to look for for particular solutions for looking for for particular context uh, and 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 not you know again uh, rushing behind uh, uh, you know uh, different technologies coming from from different places thank you thank you Gabriel uh, Mr De Grandes, any last words from your side so thanks uh, well I cannot but agree with uh, almost all the 
speakers before me, so let me just uh, restate some headlines. Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, progress on NDCs uh, and uh, pledges, which is uh, has kept on going. So there is a there must be a convergence and uh, towards the carbon neutrality. And also building on the follow-up of Sharm El Sheikh, the outcome on clean and just energy transition, specific targets on uh, renewables and energy efficiency, which is something which fits each and every region according to their potential for energy. So besides potential uh, issues on trade, uh, for sure there will be an accent on new enabling technologies, which are an opportunity for the countries. Uh, and hopefully to progress towards the phase, phase out uh, of unabated uh, fossil fuels, because otherwise you'd pay much more in terms of impact, as we see these days, uh, including in the United States, but not only, uh, which call us for the other item, which is more and more relevant, including for tra transport infrastructure, I agree, adaptation. Adaptation to extreme events, uh, adaptation uh, uh, to um, extreme heat waves, uh, which have an impact, for instance, in railway infrastructure, but in the electricity grid, so we need smart and resilient grids, uh, and adaptation in terms of building up the natural ecosystem, which is able to cope with the stressful environment. So also in terms of soil health, uh, uh, natural uh, water bodies, and so on and so forth. These are the main headlines for us. Thank you, Mr. Gans. And with that, I want to close the session. Um, but we could possibly have the last uh, slide again shown. And I want to thank uh, again all of you here in the room, especially our panelists um, and those who joined online uh, after big travels or before um, uh, big challenges ahead. And I think this discussion gave lots of inputs, lots of inspirations for the challenges ahead whether it being uh, implementation in the countries, whether it being uh, increasing ambition, but also most importantly these days, um, in, um, enhancing again the collaboration between between different regions, countries, and also the, between developed and uh, developing economies to make the GST and also the COP a uh, uh, success. And with that, no, that's that's not a, the one before. Um, we have heard that monitoring evalu evaluation is a, is a big, no, next, next one. The one with the QR code, the thank you one. Yes, thank you. So we have heard monitoring evaluation is important. So, so please um, take, give us a, take us a favor um, once in the room, um, scan the QR code and take the three uh, question post event uh, survey. And remains for me to be said, we take the learnings from this event into our final uh, report, which will be released mid July. So we take the time to really uh, um, take everything what we learned today and put it in and watch out and um, we will send the report to all of you who have participate, participated and shared through social media. And with that, thank you for, for your participation. And I mean, of course, we will stay in the room and uh, <laughs> we have these different uh, posters here with uh, some preliminary results. And we would invite everyone to take a look and have uh, uh, discussions with us if you want to. And, uh, um, yeah. Any thanks that, that you all check. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Mind you register to So uh, we have a few more minutes to go. So, <laughs> thank you for all of you. Thank you. That was quite a challenge. So many inputs. <laughs>